Keep awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Please be seated. As we explore the message of the ten bridesmaids, I invite you to the activity of watching the oil lamps in front of you. And if one of them grows, goes out, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and many vergers who will be sorry. The Ten Bridesmaids is a story about your soul. It is a story born in disappointment. In the, earliest century, in the early century, the earliest decades of our faith, even for several generations, there was a, a commonly held expectation among the faithful, among the followers of Jesus, that the return that he spoke about was imminent. Not, not some ethereal idea that Jesus will return at some point, it was a little closer to something like Jesus is returning and it's likely to be next Tuesday. It didn't happen that way, as we well know. And in fact, there was a great deal of disappointment among these communities that were now going, getting years between themselves, decades, even a few generations between the leaders and the people of the church then and those who could say that they, they actually had seen Jesus preach. Those lost its edge and disappointment crept in and a shifting sense of time began to stress the community in ways that they hadn't imagined. How long is this going to last, they thought. But then as they realized that they had no way of answering that question, suddenly they had to ask a new question, which is how will we live our lives now? How will we live out our faith now? That, I think, was the emerging question of the first century church. But it is a living and live question for us today. How do we live? the lens, the framing that this pandemic is doing to me and to all of us, leading us to ask the question, how do we live our lives today? How will we live the rest of our lives now that we've seen what we've seen, now that we've experienced what we've experienced? How do we come out of a week like this past week, a campaign, an election season, like this past year, a season of many years now of pain and polarization. How will we live our lives tomorrow and the days after? St. Matthew didn't have an answer for that question, but he did respond in the late first century to this question of, okay, now that time isn't quite what we think it is, how do we live our lives? He responds with a passage about soul, about the ten bridesmaids, five of whom don't have oil in their lamps, the other five of whom are, are prepared and have extra flasks ready to go. And when the bridesmaid arri bridegroom arrives, they are ready for him. So, yes, the, the first takeaway is that these bridesmaids were ready. They were wise because they were prepared. They were ready. They never lost their faith, which is great, but it's kind of an impossible standard, isn't it? I mean, how many of us, who here can say that they have never doubted, that they that they have ever failed to show up with enough lamp oil and said, forget it, I'll just get it on Amazon when I need it. In real life, we all have dark nights and we all begin to drift and fall asleep. That's life. The deeper pet meaning, I think, is, the, is that we must tend properly 
to our lamps. Those lamps are our souls. The main teaching here, I think, is a reminder of something that ought to be intuitively obvious to us as people of faith. But I think we forget this, and I think we say it, but we then are live so much of our lives as if it wasn't the case, and that is this. I'm going to state the obvious, but it's one that we forget. And here it is. Your soul exists. That's the first teaching. It, it is, it's a thing. In fact, it is the thing. And that we take care of our souls, and indeed, and more importantly, our souls take care of us and carry us through the darker moments. And we can trust in it and fall back in it and be healed and loved and comforted by it. Or we can instead ignore it and fall back on the comforts, the things of this world. All the things, all the things, power, stuff, self-righteousness, judgment. But those things, those comforts are fleeting and the light that it throws off is dim. Instead, let's look at the lamp of our soul. What fuel burns brightly in us, burning in the early morning and at darkest midnight? And how do we keep those lamps lit? Now, being a child of the modern age, I, I had to look up lamp oil in books. Because for me, it's always been hit a switch or flip, flick a button. Of course, here in the church world, we, we do it old school. We do truly have oil and, and wicks. Do it in the old manner. A, ve- a lamp in, the, in Scripture, simply put, is a vessel with a wick that attaches to a reservoir of fuel. It could be a bowl or a lantern filled with oil. But this, for most of history, is how we provided light, how we saw in the dark. And so from the earliest days of the church, back when back when the lamp was a perfect metaphor for soul. St. Macarius a fourth century desert mystic, said that the lamp that holds God's grace, think about this, the lamp is always burning. It's always burning. But the flame changes as the spirit ebbs and flows. He said we can't go through life with with a big burning fire all the time. That just isn't realistic. And yet there is always fire there. There is always something to be kindled and tended and passed along and shared. He said that the kindle, the light kindles up at times. And at others, it abates and it burns low. The lamp is always burning and shining. But when it is specially trimmed, it kindles up with the intoxication and love of God. To trim a lamp, it was a skill. It was a skill that came through attention and practice and repetition. In old sailing ships, the lamp trimmers, that was a job. The lamp lamp trimmers were the ones who moved about the ship, keeping the lights on, tending, cutting each of those wicks just so, so that the light that burned The lamps would burn cleanly, evenly, and without smoke. Imagine if you're down below decks and it's kicking out a whole lot of smoke. That doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? And then they'd have to refill those lamps every few hours because you can only hold but so much. And in fact, if they made the lamps too big, they'd hold too much fuel, ship rocks, oil spills out, oil catches fire, then you have a whole different problem. So you have to tend it. You have to be careful. Now, I hear in this, imagining these these lamp trimmers running about the ship. In fact, as ships shifted to electricity, they still called the electricians lamp trimmers. I hear in this not only a need to trim the lamp of my own heart, but to see our work, my work as a pastor, our work as a community of faith, 
Our work is that of lamp trimmers, scurrying about the ship, a ship that is rocking amidst a great storm in order to tend to one another's lamps. Sure. Looking all about our communities, our families, our cities, and seeing where lamps are. There is a lot of lamp tending to be done. I think that may be the clearest message I get when I think about our world. Jesus says, keep awake. Trim your lamps. Tend to your souls so that you can shine in a time of darkness. Now, while there is some harshness to this passage, it, uh, it does not end well for the foolish brides. oil that burns cheaply and runs out at the very moment you need it. The passage is really a promise of deliverance and a parable of hope to anyone who feels like it's been a long night already and we're not sure that we can take it getting any darker. Are you weary? Do you want to sleep and rest? Are the burdens of life sometimes too much to bear? We all feel that way sometimes. But Jesus says, keep your candles lit just a little bit longer. There is still work to be done, but we do not do it alone. This is not about pushing ourselves to the limit of exhaustion, but rather a promise that keeping awake for the coming of God is a promise of perfect rest and a dawn that is so much brighter than anything that we've seen before. Consider the words of the spiritual. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Keep your lamps trimmed and burning, for, the, for time is drawing nigh. Children, don't get weary. Brother, don't get weary. Sisters, don't get weary. It means something to carry a lamp through a long night, and it's not an easy thing to do. We know that it gets harder before it gets easier. That's something the hymn teaches us as well. It says, darker midnight lies before us. But it teaches us also that God's promise is coming soon. For lo, the morning sun is breaking. But if you are weary, if you are growing tired of carrying burdens, God sees you and promises to carry you through the night. But it isn't time to sleep just yet because there is work still to be done. Trimming our lamps means having a heart that is attuned both to God's presence and awakened to the brokenness of the world and keeping vigil with God. Keeping vigil means both. Keep awake, therefore, for we know neither the day nor the hour. By St. Macarius' reckoning, those five foolish bridesmaids were simply content with the world as it was and who, comfortably surrounded by all the things, sank into, and I'll use his words here, carelessness, slackness, idleness, ignorance, or fancied righteousness. We can unpack that another time, but those 4th century mystics didn't mess around. Yet we've been given lamps that burn a more life-giving fuel, an oil that burns beautifully and brings hope to the darkest of nights. 
Friends, keep those lamps trimmed and burning. Don't get weary, even as the night seems to get darker. God is with us. And the morning will soon be here. Amen.